It was just a few days ago that, that we were laughing, telling stories and sharing meals. How could this be? I wanted to. I tried. But I couldn't move. I couldn't help him. I could only watch. He was going to lead us to a new day. doesn't make any sense. It wasn't supposed to end like this. No one expected it to end like this. They were expecting a conquering hero, but instead they found a crucified friend. They were expecting a king who's going to come and claim victory. But instead, they found a cold, borrowed tomb. They were expecting that they would get to celebrate together. But instead, they found themselves mourning all alone. Everything they expected, it died on that day. But here is where the unexpected begins. Are any of you ready to leave Good Friday behind and move on to Easter? That was a lackluster yes. <laughs> Anybody ready to leave behind Good Friday and move on to Easter? Yeah. There we go. And here's where it starts. It starts like this. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Now, we introduced you to Mary Magdalene on Friday. And if you don't remember, Mary Magdalene was this woman who, before meeting Jesus, was plagued with these kind of this, this disorder. And it, it was embarrassing because it would kind of throw into this kind of spontaneous, spasmic, kind of violent seizures. After she met Jesus, I don't know how else to explain it, except to say she was healed. Seizures were gone. Her life was completely changed. So Mary becomes a follower of Jesus. She becomes a disciple. She wants everybody to experience what she's experienced. And, and she believes Jesus is exactly who he says he is. He's this coming Messiah. On Friday, though, what she'd hoped for, what she'd expected, it all died that day. But now it's Sunday. Mary wakes up early. It's still dark. Her heart's broken. She can't quite make sense of things, but she still has this deep gratitude in her heart for Jesus. So she decides she's going <clears> to <throat> go to the tomb. And she's going to go to the tomb and, and somehow, or maybe she can get someone or a group of someones to move the stone out of the way, because then she could go in and, and kind of with dignity anoint his body with oils and, and spices so to prepare it for the burial. Now, here's the most important part. You've got to get this, all right? So make sure you don't miss this. you got to get this. Here's the most important part. When Mary Magdalene went to the tomb on that Sunday morning, she expected to find Jesus' body. She expected to find his body. But when she arrived, here's what she saw. She saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. Now, when she sees the stone's been removed from the entrance, she looks inside. What's her assumption about what's going on in that moment? Is it, oh, he's risen? He's alive? No. That's not, she, she's not a superstitious person. She had no reason. She, was, she wasn't thinking resurrection at all. In fact, nobody was expecting to find no body. So it goes on and says this, this. She, so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved. Now, I think this is kind of interesting. Um, John is the one who's actually writing the account as he observes Mary Magdalene, her story. And I love kind of in a, uh, I don't know what you, Alfred Hitchcock, kind of a Mel Brooks style, he kind of writes himself right into the movie here. And he's not really that subtle about it, so he needs some work. I mean, he names Peter, and then he names himself, oh, the one that Jesus loved. <laughs> kind of like, I know he, he loves the rest of all you, but I am his favorite. <laughs> That's what he's saying, right? So it continues on from there. John's writing. Mary sees this empty tomb. She's not shouting, he's alive, he's alive. She runs all the way back to the city. She tries, she, she looks up and she, she finds Peter and she finds John and she's panicked because she's sure something has happened to Jesus' body. Peter and John are holed up in the house here and the reason they're holed up there is because they didn't want to go to the tomb like Mary because they were afraid that if the authorities had come for Jesus, they would probably come for them. So they're kind of laying low. 
So here's Peter and John at home. Mary comes bursting through the doors. She doesn't shout, he's alive, he's alive. No, <clears throat> instead, she says this. She tells them this, she says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. Now Mary Magdalene understood and she knew that Jesus had enemies. He had a lot of enemies. There were people that hated Jesus. In fact, they hated Jesus so much that they falsely accused him. They had him in, not just in prison, but they had him killed. Now, not just really just killed, but crucified, tortured. And so Mary knew, just like Peter and John knew, that when the enemies discovered that Pilate had somehow let him have this proper burial, it was not at all beyond his enemies to kind of break into that tomb, take the body, and then completely desecrate it. And furthermore, the last thing that Jesus' enemies wanted was somehow for this tomb to become like a shrine where people could kind of gather around and, in memory and remember the mission and this movement. So when Mary Magdalene, when she saw, okay, the empty tomb, she assumed the worst. I mean, things had gotten worse and worse and worse. I mean, first he's, he's a prisoner. Then there's that horrific, just mock trial. Then he gets crucified. And now somebody's stolen the body. Peter and John didn't exactly know how to make sense of it all. So they finally decide they gotta go see for themselves. So they get up, they run through the city, they run outside the city gates, and they get to the place where the tomb is, and they look inside the tomb, and there's no body. Like Mary, before them, in that moment, they don't know what to think, they don't know what to do, they don't, they don't, they don't really know who to believe, but neither of them is thinking that Jesus came back to life. Because we gotta remember this, okay? Nobody was expecting to find no body. Well, at the same time, now Mary Magdalene, for the second time, she starts back across the, across the city, a little slower this time. As she does, she finds her way there. John's observing her. John's writing the story, and John says, he sees this. He says, Mary stood out the tomb, outside the tomb, crying. Mary is just, I mean, just literally just sobbing. And you can imagine the emotion of the thoughts that are, that are starting to run through her mind. She's thinking about Jesus. This, this guy changed my life. This guy loved people that nobody else wanted to love. This people spent time with people that nobody else would spend time with. And he was crucified. He wasn't just exiled, he was crucified. And now they won't even leave his body alone. I imagine her thoughts even going to God. So God, now where do I turn? Now what do I do? And why didn't you do something? Why did this work out? So she's crying. And what happens next, it's, it's, it's powerful. It says this, it says, as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Only Mary doesn't realize. She doesn't know that they're angels. And so the angels ask her a question. And the question they ask resolve, it kind of resolves this centuries old mystery. And that's the question of this, are angels men or women? Are angels male or female? Well, it says this, it says, they ask her, woman, why are you crying? Which I think gives conclusive proof that the angels are certainly male because only a man would ask that kind of a question in this kind of a moment. <laughs> are you with me? <laughs> A little Easter humor there. You guys were just getting a little too serious. I thought I just, you know. So they do. They ask her. They, they say, why, why are you crying? And, and Mary, she's heartbroken. I mean, she's been through this gut-wrenching drama the last several days. And she, she just tells them, here's what's going on. They've taken. They've taken. And again, let's just get this. No one thinks, okay, that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, she's certain at this point there are grave robbers. That they've, they've taken the body and, and, and they've done something to desecrate it, some evil intention. And she explains to them, said, here's what's happened. They have taken, let's go to the next slide. They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. And then, as soon as she says that, then she hears something stirring behind her. All right, this is, this is I mean, this is a, obviously it's a great story, right? But this is where the story gets really, 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 really good, okay? I think anyway. Because here's what happens next, okay? At this, she turned around and she saw Jesus, okay? Put yourself in the story. Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. 
Can you imagine, okay? I mean, as far as a Christian's concerned, this is the pinnacle event in all of history, right? The pinnacle moment in all history. Jesus is back, and she doesn't recognize him. I mean, I don't know what exactly happened. I don't know if it's dark and she can't quite see him. I don't know if it's his resurrected body. It just looks different. I don't, or maybe she's just so convinced that he's dead that it, it just doesn't even occur to her. I'm not sure. But she doesn't recognize him. So instead, she just turns right back around and keeps staring into the tomb. Now, at this point, I'm kind of some conjecture, but I have to believe that Jesus is over here. And at this point, there's just like a big old smile on his face. Because he knows what's next. He knows what's about to happen next is he is going to tell Mary, and she's going to discover something that was totally unexpected. What's about to happen to Mary is absolutely unexpected. And so she's got her back to Jesus. And Jesus asks Mary, who are you looking for? Who are you looking for? And what happens next, I think, is one of the most hilarious things in all the Gospels. The only problem is when we read the Bible, we don't really read the Bible looking for humor, right? So we don't really think, oh, well, that was really funny. Because we, we're always really, you know, you've got to read the Bible seriously. So we read it seriously, we kind of miss stuff. I'm telling you, I think this is just absolutely hilarious here, here what, what, what actually happens next. Because look at this. John actually writes this. He's telling the truth about Mary. Mary, thinking he was the, she thought he was the gardener. <laughs> She thinks he's the gardener. Now, I got to, th here, here, work with me on this and see if you don't register with this. I got to think, Mary probably ended up telling this story, I'm going to say hundreds or thousands of times after this. And here's why I'm saying that. Every time she met somebody new, she'd say, oh, yeah, I'm Mary, Mary Magdalene. And then they would go, oh, that Mary, right? Oh, weren't you the one who was the first one to the tomb? Tell me your story. And so every time she met somebody new, every time she was at a party, oh, Mary, tell your story. She had to tell her story. And so she'd tell her story. And every time she'd tell her story, she would get to this point in the story, and she'd kind of start with some of the self-deprecating kind of laughter, and she'd say, and what happened next was totally unexpected. I'm, she's telling us, I'm staring in the tomb, I'm talking to the guy behind me, and I thought he was the gardener. And everybody laughs. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm just, you guys don't get it, but I'm sure this is very, 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 very funny, okay? Why did she think he was the gardener? Because nobody was expecting to find nobody. Even when they're staring in the tomb, no one thought Jesus was alive. They, they, they saw him die. They expect him to stay dead. So Mary now, I mean, she thinks he's the gardener, and she, and she says this to him. She says, sir, if you're the one, if you're the one, right? If you're the one who's carried away, tell me, where have you put him, and I'll go get him. She's still staring at an empty tomb. She's talking to this gentleman, whoever he is, right over her shoulder, the gardener. And here's where everything changes. Here's where everything changes. The Bible tells us at that point, then Jesus calls her name. He says, Mary. Mary. Mary, he calls her name. I want you to put yourself in the story. Can you imagine, okay? Imagine how her countenance must have shifted, how her, and just the look on her face as she hears her name come from that voice. Can you imagine, imagine the shock as it starts to register, she starts to understand what's actually going on here. And, and try to hear her, okay? Hear her kind of whisper back, Jesus? Jesus? Rabboni? Meaning teacher? Jesus? She, she's overcome with emotion. I mean, she's stunned. And I want you to get this, okay? This could not have been more unexpected. Jesus had done the unexpected in her life before, and here it was on Easter that, she is do that he is doing the unexpected again, and everything changes. This could not have been more unexpected. Well, next what happens is Jesus gives her some important instructions. He says this, go to my brothers and you tell them. In other words, Mary, I know you've already been back and forth across the city a couple times. I need you to go one more time, but this time you're gonna go back to them and you're gonna tell them this unexpected message. And so it says that she did. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. Now we need to pause there for a little bit because otherwise if we don't kind of delve into what's going on, we're gonna miss something really important. Why is it a big deal that Mary Magdalene was the one who went and delivered the news? Why is that so important? Here's why it's important. 
You see, for, for a couple of reasons. In the ancient world, in the first century, a woman's testimony had no credibility at all. Zero. Zilch. A woman was not allowed to testify in court. And if you brought a woman to court to testify, everybody would kind of laugh you out of court because it was like, no, she can't testify. What are you doing? Yet, and I think this says a lot about Jesus' view on women, when Jesus rises from the dead, he chooses as his first witness who? You can actually talk back if you want to. <laughs> who? A woman, right. Now, here's why this is important. I think that's significant, but I think it's also a significant apologetic, a proof for the resurrection. Think about this. See, if you're making up a story, if you're trying to fabricate a story that everybody's gonna believe in the first century, you would not have a woman be your primary witness. So why then? Why then in all four gospel accounts, why do all four gospel writers record that the first person to see Jesus and then go back and tell the men was a woman? You know why? Because that's the way it happened. <laughs> that's the way it happened. And so now Mary Magdalene, she, she's sharing the news and she says this. She says, I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. I'll tell you what, I'll, 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 how about all the women, okay? How about all the women on the count of three? I've seen the Lord. One, two, three. I've seen the Lord. There you go. It feels pretty good, doesn't it? feels pretty good. Now, here's the thing. What Mary actually expected was a crucified friend. She expected this cold borrowed tomb. She expected to mourn all alone, all alone. But what she got, what she got on that Easter morning was an unexpected beginning. That heartbreaking ending on Friday became an unexpected brand new beginning on Sunday when Mary found what nobody expected. That was to find no body. And here's the thing. Let's turn the corner. I don't think we're that much different than Mary. And when I say we're not that much different than Mary, I think for a whole lot of us in this room, and maybe every one of us in different parts of our lives, even though we are here, we're here, it is Easter Sunday, 2018. It is Easter. I think there's a whole lot of us that are still stuck with parts of our lives living in a Good Friday world. Parts of our lives, even though we're celebrating Easter and Easter's arrived, we're still stuck in a Good Friday world. There's parts of our lives we think it's over. We think hope is lost. It's, we have nothing left to do except accept the inevitable. Our hearts are broken. It feels like the end. It feels like Friday. And for some of us, for some of us, it may, it may be a loss. It may be the loss of a dream. It may be the loss of a loved one or a family member. And the mourning and the grieving, it's got a grip on you and it feels like Friday and it feels like it's always gonna be Friday. There's some of us, we have behavior patterns. There's just there's stuff that we keep doing. We don't even know why we keep doing them. We wanna stop doing them, but we keep doing them. Maybe they're even addictions. But we just keep doing it, and, and they threaten to destroy every good thing that God has put in our life. And every time it happens, it feels like, man, we just get pulled right back to Friday. For some of us, there's enough people in this room and enough people in our overflow. It, it, it might be your marriage. I mean, a marriage that once was vibrant, had so much promise and even romance. But, I mean, you're barely cohabitating now, and it feels like every day living together is like a Friday. Maybe something with your kids. I mean, you've prayed, and you've worried, you checked in, and no matter how hard you try, it's like they keep running from you, and they keep running from God. And it feels like one of those areas you're about to give up, and it feels like Friday. It might be your health. It feels like your body's betrayed you. The news from the doctor is not good. And your life kind of reads like a story that's already been written. You just gotta play out the lines. It feels like you're stuck in a Good Friday world. Here's the good news, okay? Here's the good news this Easter. Are you with me on this? Here's the good news. For me, for you, for every one of us, today is Sunday. Today's Easter Sunday. And what we, is anybody excited about that? <laughs> and here's the thing, if that's true, and if you're genuinely excited about that, okay? If that's true that you really believe this stuff, then that means we worship, we follow a God who allows and often does unexpected beginnings over and over again. Over and over again. I want to introduce you to a guy named Ken.
Ken's a guy who, uh, I don't know how else to say, he was a guy who, who it was, it was, didn't have much hope, he felt broken, and he felt like his life had come to an end. Here's his story. My name's Ken Hurley. I attend community with my wife Susan and my two daughters Alyssa and Mackenzie for roughly two years now. My daughter Alyssa was on a spiritual journey of her own and she convinced us to find a new church and get more involved with the community. And a friend of my wife's suggested Plainfield Community. For the previous 20 years, there was a lot of unanswered questions. There were a lot of, why did this happen? Why did that happen? As soon as I sat down in that service and the energy, and it's like something woke me up to where Maybe I will find those answers now. Maybe it's time to explore those unanswered questions to help me find my way back to God. Woke up one morning in probably late December and I took two steps and it was like the world ended. I got blurry eyed like I was looking through a fishbowl. Um, I lost all sense of hearing and I basically just collapsed. Turns out I had a 97% blocked carotid artery. As the surgery started getting closer and the anxiety started kicking in, I, I thought for sure that this wasn't going to turn out well for me. So I called a buddy of mine and I told him I had written letters to my family. I wanted to make sure that he knew where they were at and he was able to hand them out just in case. I didn't want to leave them not knowing how I felt about them and how I see them through my eyes. For the past 20 years prior to community, I really didn't pray to God. And now I found myself wanting to pray to God for his help. I met with Wendy on the prayer team, told her to say a prayer for not only myself and the surgery and the surgeon, but more importantly for my wife and my two daughters that they're gonna be okay. I woke up from surgery and immediately I felt a new connection to God. I, I felt that I have found my way back and he was definitely looking out over me. Not even two hours after surgery, I grabbed my phone and I was emailing John to tell him about my experience and my wife happened to look at me and says, what are you doing on your phone? She thought I was working. And I said, I'm emailing John to tell him about what happened and what I'm feeling now and how I have definitely have a new focus in life and I want to dedicate my life to God, thanking Him for watching out over me and my family during the surgery. I'm looking forward to living my next 40 years in a better situation involved around God. My plan was to be baptized already, but per doctor's orders, uh, the surgery incision was not quite healed yet but I'm very much looking forward to the next opportunity I can be baptized. Jesus called my name and said, there is a reason why you're staying on this earth. I love Ken's story, because I mean, here's a guy who, I mean, in his words, Jesus called my name, and he got an unexpected beginning, what? Spiritually, right? Unexpected beginning spiritually, found his way back to God. An unexpected beginning physically, kind of a new lease on this life. And also an unexpected beginning uh, relationally with his family that he thought was over. And I think, I think God wants to do the same thing in your life. So again, let's go back. I think many of our stories are just like Mary Magdalene's. Think about Mary Magdalene. Here she was on Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday, the resurrection had already happened but you know what? It didn't impact, it didn't change Mary because she didn't realize it. Maybe some of us don't fully realize it. See, the new beginning, it had actually already started, but Mary was stuck in sad endings because she didn't recognize him. New life had already come, right? A new day had already dawned. Easter Sunday was here, but Mary continued to live over here in Friday. But the pivotal moment, the, the pivotal moment in Mary's story came <clears throat> when she recognized him, she realized he'd risen, she stopped dwelling in Friday, and that moment came when she heard him say her name, Mary. 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 
And see, the resurrection, it was already true before that. But it didn't become real in Mary's life. It didn't change anything in Mary's life until she heard Jesus say her name. And I think the same thing's true for me and for you, for all of us. Some of us, we think it's all over. We think hope is gone. You've got this broken heart, and it feels like the end. But I'm telling you, the catalytic moment, the catalytic moment for what the Bible calls resurrection power being experienced in your life, okay, is the moment you recognize that Jesus is actually calling your name. He's calling your name. He's saying, Dave, or Caitlin, or Jackie, or Brent, or Robert, or Mary, or Linda, Scott, Allison, Terry, Elena, Alexa, Autumn, Delora, Erica. The Bible tells us that he's just, he just relentlessly pursues us. He's always calling our name. Sometimes we just don't recognize it. Sometimes we don't realize it. But that moment, that moment that you realize, the moment that you recognize it, and then you respond the same way that Mary did, Rabboni, teacher, Lord, Jesus, and you say his name, I'm telling you, that is the catalytic event for unexpected beginnings in your life, that resurrection power becoming a reality. And I want that for every one of you. I want that for every one of you in this room. In a moment, what I'm going to give you a chance to do is I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet, and we're all just going to say the name of Jesus out loud. And then I'm going to say a prayer, and then after I say that prayer, we're going to sing a song. And the song, it's a, it's a terrific song that we started just the first part of it at the beginning of the service called What a Beautiful Name. And it says, what a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. And then it goes on to say, and what a wonderful name it is. And then it concludes by saying, what a powerful, powerful name it is. And in fact, in Romans, it tells us this, that whoever calls on the name of Jesus, I don't know, there's just something about it. It's personal. It's, it's God's name. Whoever calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. And some of us, we do. We need, we need being saved for the first time so we, we get to know Jesus and we have the assurance of heaven. But some of us, we just need to be saved again from all the stuff that has us stuck in Friday. That has us stuck in Friday. When actually there's an Easter reality he means for us to experience. So I'm gonna ask you to stand right now. Would you stand? And let's just all, okay, say that beautiful name, that wonderful name, that powerful name together on the count of three. The name of Jesus. One, two, three. Three, Jesus. Jesus. Father God, we come to you right now. And Lord, I ask that in a supernatural way, the way that you work, the way that we've seen you work over and over again, that you help every person sense, not only know it in their head, but feel in their hearts that you are calling their name. The same way that you called Mary into this new reality of resurrection power, that you're calling all of us into that with unexpected beginnings, brand new beginnings. For some of us, it's in our relationships. For some of us, it's in our careers. For some of us, it's, it's, it's in health. For some of us, it's just the, the knowing that we're going to see loved ones again someday. Lord, we ask that you make that real, that you call our name. And then, Lord, we're going to respond in this song by declaring and singing out your name, that beautiful name, the powerful name, the name of Jesus. Amen.